Hi and welcome to the Journalism Salute. I'm Mark Simon. In each episode, we'll talk to or about an interesting person or organization related to journalism. The intent is to show that journalists are not the enemy of the people. Thank you for listening. On this episode, we are joined by Nick Toso. He is the founder and CEO of Roly and a former producer at CNN, uh, CNN Español. Nick, thank you for taking the time to join us. First question is the same as that we ask for everyone. Can you give us the story of your journalism career path? Yeah, well, Mark, thanks for, for having me. This is uh, great to join you. I think the, the story of my journalism career path, let's see, I was always interested in news and journalism, even at a, a young age. And actually, my first job was a paper boy for the local newspaper when I was 11 or 12. So I guess you could say I got a I got a head start, but my, my real path, I think, started much later after, after college. I was a freshman at Boston University in September of 2001 when, when 9-11 happened. And shortly after that, I declared my major in international relations. I was very interested in foreign service work and the work done by the State Department. And it was uh, one of those summers that I landed an internship at the U.S. International Broadcasting Bureau in D.C., which is the Voice of America's Latin America division, essentially producing TV news for a Latin American audience. And it was at that internship that I really, really fell in love with journalism and media. Uh, I actually went to go work for VOA after college, but I really consider that the start of my career path in journalism. Now, back then at VOA, we were still using beta cassettes. I don't know if you remember those. Well, everyone else was making the switch to digital, those big clunky cassettes. And prior to every show, we had to organize those tapes in order for the tape operator in the control room so that the correct tape would play in order. If you mess one tape up, it's a bad, bad domino effect. And basically you have to cut to commercials and, and, re- and reorganize the tape. So it was a really important task, but that was really my first news production job. I was the show tape organizer. And it grew from organizing tapes to actually organizing the show and then managing the reporters and their deadlines to finally producing the show in, in a live setting in a control room. So after three years of, of doing that, you know, I became the supervising producer for our shows at, at VOA. And it was around that three-year mark that I was actually recruited by CNN Español to join their DC Bureau. At the time, they were launching their first Spanish, Spanish language shows produced outside of Atlanta. And I was part of that launch team. We had two shows, Directo USA and Choque de Opiniones. And I grew through the ranks there for about another three years, covering elections, doing interviews with the world leaders, really great assignment. And then I was promoted to the role of DC Bureau Chief for CNN Español at the age of, of 30. I loved that job and, and the people I was working with. And I felt like I could be there forever, Mark. It was really great. But at the same time, I always had this entrepreneurial spirit and I wanted to do my MBA and start my own business. So in the summer of 2017, I pivoted and announced to my team that I'd be resigning to pursue that. And over the course of the next three months, we married my, my then fiance, we sold our home and moved to California to start a, a life on the, on the West Coast, where I currently run my startup Roly. Now, we should mention, too, that you were born in Chile. Uh, yes. Was there something in your upbringing that would have yeah. made uh, journalism a more likely career path for you? Yeah, that's a really good question, Mark. You know, I, I do think that a prerequisite for good journalism is, is empathy. And the best way to gain empathy is to meet people from all walks of life. And I had a very international upbringing, as you point out. I was obviously, I was born in Chile, moved to the U.S. when I was young. But also my, my father worked in international development work. And from a very young age, we traveled the world with him. And not the typical vacation countries, usually countries that needed development. And one of my first and most impactful memories was traveling, traveling to Ivory Coast, uh, Cote d'Ivoire in Africa and when I was maybe five or six. And I would come back from those trips and tell my friends about it and show them the souvenirs, the photos. And I didn't realize that at the time, but I was essentially travel reporting <laughs> at a very young age without, without knowing it. And, and it then became my dream to be a Nat Geo explorer and the whole thing. But I think that's what, what set me on this path. And we'll talk about your about Roly in a little bit, but I do want to explore your time at CNN in particular. Among the interviews that you did that were done under your supervision were with former President Clinton, President Obama, pop star Gloria Estefan. You also led election coverage and produced uh, a daily and a weekly show. And I'm going to guess that there's a lot of logistical work involved in all of these. Can you walk Mm -hmm. me through the steps involved in securing executing and then post-producing one of those interviews or projects that you worked on? 
yeah, let's let's talk about you know the, the presidential interviews. I think we'll, we'll start. We could start there. And, and obviously, being a good producer has a heavy, heavy dose of managing complex logistics. And that's obviously no different when you're interviewing a president. Those profile, high profile interviews, you put in requests for them essentially to the media offices of the different uh, agencies or departments, and and they're given to you and granted to you. You know, hopefully within a reasonable time frame. From that point, once you've kind of secured the date and you understand the topics and, and things of that nature, you'll start coordinating with the White House or Secret Service if they need to plan an advanced visit to your interview site or if you need to provide your, your vitals and the information of your crew and everyone who's going to be uh, coming to the White House. Now, if you're working in the DC Bureau, chances are you've already had a lot of this background work done. You have your capital pass. You have a lot of the DC type credentials already uh, in place. So it's, it's a little bit uh, easier in that sense. If you don't have those things in place, it could take a little bit longer, but those are very important steps and also very well established. Now, usually when you come to the White House for a presidential interview, that interview might, you might have you know, 15 or 20 minutes with the actual president, but you need to show up in the early, early morning to set up. You might be setting up for three or four hours uh, before the president shows up. And that involves getting your entire crew through uh, the security check. Then you, you have, obviously have to leave the room to do a security sweep and then come back to the room and wait for, for the, once the president actually shows up, it's, it's very quick. Everyone's in place. The microphones are on. You, 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 you know, the microphone goes on the president and the interview start, starts. Obviously, president is a very, very busy person. So we don't take up too much of, of their time. And then as quickly as it starts, before you know it, it's over. And you take a nice photo with, with the president and your crew and, and just kind of sit down and, and maybe find time for lunch. But it's a lot of preparation. And when the, the actual interview happens, it's, it's, it's gone in, in a flash. <laughs> I'm curious about the question writing process uh, yeah. for something like that, particularly at CNN Espanol, where the issues that are important to a Spanish speaking audience might be a little mm. different from the issues that are important to an English speaking audience. What is the question li- writing process like? Yeah, that's a really good, that's a really good question as well. You know, first I'll say that I was very fortunate to work with some very good interviewers at Sierra Espanol and learned a lot of that from them. But as you, as you mentioned, you know, when thinking about your questions, you have to consider your audience. What do they want to know? You're, you're essentially asking questions on their behalf. So as you point out at Sierra Espanol, a lot of our audience was international. So at times those questions, especially on political topics, were much more about the overall process and understanding the U.S. electoral process or something of that nature, rather than asking them about what somebody tweeted or things like that. So that's, that's first and foremost when, when talking about an international audience. That's how the questions are a little bit different from a, maybe a domestic audience. But coming up with those questions involves a big, big dose of, of research. You obviously have to consider your audience uh, and any recent news that the expert or world leader can comment on and envision how that conversation will flow. But having said that, as important as it is to do your research and come into the interview with a lot of good questions, it's equally as important to listen to the answers being given and be ready to pivot during the interview and ask follow-ups if, if needed. It's, it's not great to just stick to those questions or not hear the responses because you're thinking about your next question. And I actually think some of the best questions actually come up during the interview as follow-ups. I also usually found that some of the best responses were given when the interviewer simply asks, you know, is there anything you'd like to add? at the end of the interview. Uh, some of the best sound bites we got were actually the last sound bite in the interview. Was there um, anything that, that Obama in particular said that was particularly memorable? Well, we interviewed him around a lot of immigration policy discussions. And I think a lot of that also had to do with uh, the US relationship with Cuba, which was making news at the time. And there were a lot of statements and things that he said in the interview that reflected a major foreign policy shift from the last few decades. So those were all very memorable. You really got the sense that you were witnessing history in that interview as he was making declarations that you know, the last four or five presidents before him had not made. You also uh, produced both a daily and a weekly show. And I'm curious what the logistics were involved uh, in the production mm. of those. Yeah, so I think that's a really uh, interesting point too. You know, you start every day with a blank slate. 
you know what's going on in the world and you have your morning editorial meeting and you, it's very entrepreneurial in that sense that you know what, what you want to achieve, but you're starting with, with nothing. So we'll have a morning editorial meeting, we'll agree on the topics, and then you assign work. You have reporters, you have camera crews, you have writers, you have obviously your anchor, and everyone then kind of gets their assignment, whether it's find me three guests for this segment, or you have to go to the Department of State and do an interview and do a package for 5 p.m., and you, everyone kind of splits off during the day and then has their deadline. So if your show is at 5 or 6 p.m., usually around three or four, or maybe an hour or two, you start to see all this content coming in. Maybe the reporter is turning in the package. The final preparations for welcoming the guests or experts to your studio are being made. The scripts are being written and checked. And all the preparations are being made in your technical rundown so that your director uh, knows what cameras to take and what how how the show is going to play out and what videos to take. So it's usually you know the last few hours of that production are, are usually pretty stressful trying to get all those elements in, trying to put the whole show together. Usually you're scrambling around and just like just like that before you know it, you're in the studio and you know an hour later you're done and and you wonder what happened. But it goes by very quickly uh, once you once you start producing. As someone who previously worked at ESPN for 16 years, you, you basically described that exactly how I would describe the production of a show like SportsCenter. Mm. Um, so it's interesting how it translates from news to sports, and I'm sure entertainment, similar, just di essentially different people, different stories, uh, mm. different situations that you find yourself involved in. Was there a particularly memorable area of coverage in your time doing that? Yeah, I mean, because we were the CNN Espanol Bureau in D.C., it was our job to, you know, report on everything that was basically happening in the U.S. We were the America Bureau, basically, or the United States Bureau, basically. And I think that the most memorable component and the largest component was the political coverage. Now, that involved a lot of coverage from D.C., from our studios, but we also traveled to all the debates, which were usually held at universities. The conventions, which were usually held at convention centers in cities around the country, you know, sometimes we would go to random towns, whether they were in important districts or on the border, if we were talking about immigration, and do reports from there. I think what really marked uh, my career at CNN was getting out of the beltway, like we say, outside of the beltway and doing a lot of this reporting from where the actual news is, is happening. And I loved that. I loved field producing. It was so fun. It was so fun for me. What was the best experience you had with that? Ooh, I would say we followed the Pope in Cuba for about two weeks. Uh, this was Pope Francis, the current Pope, traveled to Cuba, which is a, a, not a religious country. Only 8% of Cubans are, are because of, of the communist system. But that was very, very memorable. I had never been to Cuba. I always wanted to go to Cuba. It was obviously very difficult to travel there for, for reasons uh, having to do with the embargo. But being in Havana and working there for two weeks, and not only seeing that, but seeing uh, the Cubans embrace this Pope in a way that I had never really witnessed any, anything on that level before. It was very impactful. So I loved it from a cultural perspective, from a production perspective, because you're, you're producing in, in a country that doesn't have the most modern, you're really stretching your technology as far as it can go. And, and I just love the, the assignment. I, I loved following that Pope around, listening to his message of hope in, in, in places that really needed hope. Is Cuba your favorite country to have uh, reported produced from? I think so. I would have to say so. Yeah. We did some coverage from Panama. There was a big regional summit in Panama and Panama is also just a very beautiful country, but that summit was, was amazing because it gathered world leaders from across Latin America, as well as civil organizations from across Latin America. And that was like, like getting a whole lay of the land in one, in one city, you know, from Argentina to Mexico, all in one city for one week. It was a, a bit of a world's fair. That was also a very great assignment. When we've had people on who worked at particularly big organizations like the New York Times or Washington Post, or in your case now CNN, I always try and ask this question because I think mm -hmm. this happens to everybody. At some mm -hmm. point in your career, was there a mistake that you made or that mm. your, your crew made 
from which you learned a lesson that uh, would be good to relay to uh, aspiring journalists? Yeah, I'll, I'll have a very pragmatic one, and then I'll give you a more open-ended one. And I think the most pragmatic one is always have a plan B. Always expect that your plan A is not going to make it. Always think that for some reason your, your package won't get in and they're going to need to take you live tossing to sound bites. Have those sound bites ready. Have your plan B ready for everything you do. Always a plan B. Because if there's no plan B, you know, your broadcast can go to black or, you know, you can affect the next segment or you can make it really difficult for people in the control room. So I've had my fair share of those where I didn't have a plan B and I've learned to always plan for the unexpected. But I think a more open-ended mistake and, and advice would be that, you know, I think very early in my career, I had a, a set idea of what I wanted to do. And that mindset actually closed me off to a lot of opportunities. And I think since realizing that my greatest asset in my career has been reversing that mindset and learning how to do everything in the newsroom, even outside of my job description, whether it was running teleprompter or manning a camera, uh, that allowed me to grow into new rules, roles and get promoted much faster. So I, I think that if you want to be successful in news, especially today, learn how to do everything in the newsroom and, and all the new technology, all the new platforms, learn those as well. What makes for a good camera operator? Oh, I think a good camera operator. Well, first, you need to be very attentive and pay a lot of attention to not only what's happening on set, but what your director is saying. So it's not just looking through the viewfinder and making sure that you're following the law of thirds or, 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 or composition rules like that. But it's very easy when you're running a camera to uh, not pay attention to other things happening. And you really need to do that especially when you're in a live show. Sometimes you'll have a camera operator who's not listening to the director and, you know, for one reason or another, you can't take that, that camera. And that's, that's killer. And since you brought it up, I've watched people run teleprompters and I feel like I've seen people do well with it. And I've seen mm. people not necessarily do well with it. I've never yeah. had the chance to do it. Uh, yeah. What makes, but you just said that you had to learn every skill. Yes. Uh, what makes for a good teleprompter person? Yeah, I think the first thing is you have to be very familiar with the person that you are teleprompting for, their cadences. Sometimes an anchor might jump around a little bit. You have to know where that anchor is going so that you can pick up to where they're going to where they're going to pick up on the script. That could be very tricky. I, I, I'm not surprised to know that, you know, a lot of anchors have their favorite tele prompter operators and they actually kind of almost share a brain you know when I got very familiar running teleprompter for for a specific anchor I knew when that anchor went off script but I knew that I couldn't keep moving the teleprompter forward because he was going to come right back to the point where I was so you almost have this this ESP of uh, of knowing your your anchor I think that's the most important thing when you're run, running teleprompter and also, obviously, uh, keep a very steady hand. Don't go too fast. Uh, make sure you follow their pace. Yeah. That I love that job. because that's one of the hidden things in television. And again, just from having worked in it uh, before, it's something that it's, it's, you can't just throw anyone in there and no. expect them to be, to be great at it. Now, no. too, that the CNN that you and I grew up with is different from the CNN that you worked for. And the yeah. CNN that you worked for is a lot different from the CNN that presently exists. Yeah. And you mentioned to me, volunteered this, that one of the most mm -hmm. interesting and relevant topics for you regarding CNN was witnessing the digital revolution hit the CNN newsroom and change news forever. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious, what did you see? Yeah, that was, and I'm sure it hit all newsrooms similarly, but I remember shortly after joining CNN in, in 2010, digital really started picking up. You started to see a lot of hires for digital. And at the same time, you saw a lot of the news audience, the news consumer, starting to get their news online for free, essentially. And aside from the fact that our attention span started shrinking to about 140 characters, if you were on Twitter the revenues that a news network got from online advertising were also because before you get them from the cable subscribers, but people started cutting their cords. So the business of news production started to change. We had tighter turnarounds for the on-demand internet culture. Our pieces had shorter shelf lives because there was always that next piece, that next tweet, that next thing you click on. 
uh, and we had smaller production budgets as well. You know, whereas before we could have the budget to send a team of 30 people to Louisiana to cover an oil spill and win a Peabody. Now we had to invite guests on set and we became very reliant on experts and in-studio guests to produce our content because A, it was, it was free. We didn't have to pay for hotels or, or plane tickets or things like that over time. But I think this was a, a, a pivotal shift in how people started watching the news or chose, chose their news sources. There was a lot, there was a higher degree of opinion on TV now because of the in-studio guests and less on the ground reporting. Uh, and you actually started to see people arguing with each other on TV. Now, there were always shows like this, but this was much more common now. You would turn on any news show and you would see people literally at each other's throats. And, and for those that don't know, as soon as the camera's off, they're buddy-buddy and exchanging business cards. I mean, they don't hate each other, really. But you were really reliant on these in-show guests. And we started to have more and more contributors, people who, who you know, were on a, on a contract. So that's why sometimes you would see a lot of the same people on several times a day. But overall, I really think that digital changed how we produce news and how, how the news consumers is getting news today. I saw that over the course of my career at CNN. And that was true regardless whether it was CNN, CNN Espanol, or any aspect uh, yeah. of, of CNN. Absolutely. So this, this segues into the app that you've created, which I'll mm -hmm. point out, free for journalists. It's called Rolly, R O. R-O-L-L-I, it's basically a computerized Rolodex, a directory of subject experts who pay a fee to be uh, listed and essentially invented by you and your staff. What is the app's origin story? Yeah, so that, you know, really the story I just told led me to start this app. So, you know, after I, I resigned my position at CNN, I was in business school thinking of, of business ideas, essentially, and, and received maybe the best piece of advice I've ever gotten from anybody. And it was from a professor. And the advice was simply, do what you know. Just think about what you know and, and solve a problem that you know about. So I started thinking about my, my experience at CNN. And I think when we were at the at DC Bureau, I think we handled close to three quarters of the guests for the network. I mean, there were a lot of interviews a lot of guest booking going on in, in the DC Bureau because you have a lot of NGOs, think tanks, you have embassies, world leaders coming in and out, events. I mean, there's just a lot of uh, people coming through DC and, and good interviews coming through DC. But finding those people still took a lot of time and we were still doing it in a very archaic way, looking at our own phone books or, or Rolodexes, like you say, asking for recommendations, uh, reading books, doing research wherever we can find materials. But when you can't find the absolute perfect guest within deadline, you still have to have somebody. So at times, the segment or interview, it could have been better. You could have had a better interview. And, you know, if we could create better content, that content is going out to millions of homes around the world. So the fact that you improve one guest, it isn't just, oh, this guest was a little bit better. Like you're actually broadcasting this to millions and millions of people. So we, we decided we could do an even better job of informing the public if we started a free platform like, like a Rolodex. And like you say, uh, we have experts and organizations that join us. They pay a very, very low yearly platform fee that allows us to service them and, and vet their accounts and keep the platform up and running, essentially. But journalists can use Roly to find vetted subject matter experts across all topics and events. And we help them produce amazing content within their deadlines, regardless of their budget, essentially. So you're basically, essentially, you're trying to be a better version of Google in a way. Yeah, because you know what happens with Google? When you type something in Google, you're going to find a bunch of old articles quoting the same experts. Yep. So you can find an expert from that article, but you're really inviting the same person onto your show. And you're not increasing the diversity of thought. You're not bringing new people into the fray, new people into the conversation. So I think what, what Roly really does is allow you to find those new experts who are extremely, extremely qualified, but maybe haven't been quoted in, in five articles in Google. And I look at the list, uh, this is essentially looking at your Twitter of experts that are on there, sleep scientists, genome sequencing experts, and someone promoting, I thought this was interesting, Firefighter Cancer Awareness Month. So niche expertise seems to be a, a strength of, of what your app brings. 
from your experience, what are the, t- the hardest type of people to find? I mean, you think of a story that's, that's happening now, baby formula. There's a shortage of baby formula. Sure, you could talk to a nutritionist, but does that nutritionist know about baby formula? Remember the cave diver story? The, the students in Thailand that were stuck in the cave? Where do you find the cave diver who's expert in, in actual cave diver rescues? I think there were seven in the world. <laughs> Nobody could find them. Things like that, that you might think are once in a blue moon, but they actually happen every single day. Even major stories like COVID, many doctors can talk about COVID. You could get most doctors to give you a very well-informed on COVID or things like that. But wouldn't you rather interview a lead virologist that actually worked on the trials or something like that? So I think it's about finding the most appropriate guest with the most knowledge on, on any given subject, really. What do you want the app to be a few years from now? Yeah, so we're releasing a lot of new features this summer. So check us out at, at rollyapp.com. But essentially, as podcasts grow, as more journalists go independent, as more people work outside of the newsroom remotely, journalists need resources and the research of a large newsroom to provide and produce their, their best content within deadline. So the vision for Roly is to provide them with all of that, all the research, all the power of a large newsroom from your living room or your mobile phone, essentially. Regardless of your budget, you could be a team of two podcasters and you could produce the most well-researched quality content by using our platform. And we should mention again, uh, it is free for journalists. That's Uh, correct. It's free and will always be free for for journalists. So um, looking at this from the perspective of you saw an issue and you stepped in to try to essentially create a business to change it. Is there a niche that journalists should be looking to fill? I think that's a really good question. I would say this, when you're looking at niches to fill, our job as journalism, as journalists is really to, to, to look around the world and tell the stories of, of the people who can't tell the stories themselves. So whether that means you're telling the, 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 the story of an underrepresented or marginalized group here in the U.S., of which there are plenty, or Mother Nature, meaning climate reporting. Find the stories of the people who can't tell the stories themselves because they have really interesting things to say and they need representation in the media. But I will say that, that minorities are still vastly underrepresented in our news content, and we need to do a better job of that. This, this podcast has uh, tried to be of help in uh, that regard, certainly. And what tips do you have for people who are looking to create what I would call a journalism adjacent business? Yeah, well, first, uh, I would say that if you are a journalist, you're in a good spot because journalists are problem solvers and very resourceful. So that's going to help you in any business. Uh, but I would advise anybody looking to, to do this in a journalism adjacent business is to to challenge themselves to solve some of the greatest problems journalism has today. Misinformation, or the fact that newsroom jobs are being cut every day. According to Pew, I saw a figure that said over a quarter of our newsroom staff has been laid off since 2008. We can really, really help our industry with some entrepreneurial thinking right now. And I regularly think, I speak with entrepreneurs in this space The work they do is inspiring, but we need more business leaders offering fresh ideas and innovations in this space. It's it's too important. Is there a particular journalism business done by someone else that you're particularly uh, a fan of? Yes, there are uh, many actually, but I will say that there are some businesses that are helping empower local news by giving them platforms to create essentially local news channels with everything they need to uh, interact with their local audiences, create the website and distribute the content. I I think that local news has always been uh, a shining star in the journalism world, but it's really hard for uh, local news startups to start because low budgets and, and smaller markets. So I have seen some projects that help empower local news Uh, to really just get off the ground. And I love those projects. Can you tell us about one of those businesses? Yeah, sure. I I spoke with the the CEO of a company. uh, It's called Lead, L-E-D-E. And and they describe themselves as a a purpose-built platform for independent publishers. But what they really do is they have 
a technology platform that allows you to create your web presence, start newsletters, start podcasts, interact with your community on the local level. And it's really, uh, it's a really interesting platform. They serve kind of as an incubator for upstart journalist-led publishers. Uh, and I think it's a, an example of some fresh entrepreneurial thinking that's helping an industry maintain a high quality of journalism where, you know, in a situation where maybe you don't have a ton of resources to do it. The show is called The Journalism Salute, and we always ask journalists to close. Is there a journalist or journalism organization that you would like to salute for their good work? Yeah, you know, I actually wanted to take this this opportunity. I know this is a question you ask. Uh, I wanted to salute all the team that was working on CNN Plus and are now most of them looking for new opportunities. Uh, that was really a group of amazing, talented people who are now available to make amazing contributions to news organizations around the country and the world. Many of them are, are looking for work right now, and, and I want to salute them as they push on in their news career. Uh, and as we say at USC, fight on. Certainly. Nick Toso, thank you for taking the time to join us. Best of luck with your uh, with Roly. Thanks. Thanks for having me. All over the world, democracy is on the knife's edge. If the West had stood up for democracy, Russia would not have been able to put tanks there today. The same tanks and the same troops that are threatening the homes of people I love. And at home, we're fighting for the soul of America. We walked up in here amongst hostile people. There's KKK here, there's skinheads here, there's all kinds of that stuff here. We are not afraid. We are not afraid. Don't miss Democracy in Danger, a podcast that's saving government by the people one week at a time. Find us at dindanger.org and wherever you get your audio. Thank you for listening to the Journalism Salute. Please let us know what you think of the show. You can find us on Twitter at JournalismPod, and you can email us at JournalismSalute at gmail.com.